Live from New York City, it's The Gary Knoll Show. And now, your host, Gary Knoll. Hi everyone, I'm Gary Knoll. Nice to have you with us today. We're going to find out how a molecule in oranges can help you lose weight and save you from a heart attack or a stroke. Wow. Good news from Western University in Canada, published in the Journal of Lipid Research. We have about 12 really good studies every day. We use only peer-reviewed literature from highly respected institutions showing you how we can live a longer and healthier life. Also today, time permitting, what Chris Hedges has to say in an article on Truth Dig about the idea that you and I don't count. But what does count is that we only have one choice in this election. That's it. Quote, there's only one choice in this election, the consolidation of oligarchical power under Donald Trump or the consolidation of oligarchical power under Joe Biden. I think that's very important that we have that conversation because MSNBC, CNN, Washington Post, New York Times, they're all on the side of Biden, all supportive of the Council on Foreign Relations and neoliberalism, and but disguising themselves with some self-righteous indignation. How dare you question us as being good liberals? No, those of us who have been good liberals absolutely challenge you. You're frauds, and we're calling you out. So we're going to get into that today. Also, I'm going to be playing some videos, and I'd like your feedback, because today we saw the largest drop, the worst opening of Wall Street in its entire history. It was down almost 2,000 points. It's recovered. It'll probably, you know, make a major recovery later. But this is all about oil in the Middle East and Saudi Arabia. And we pride Saudi Arabia on being an ally. Well, what kind of ally is it that we sell them the weapons of destruction and they use it against innocent civilians in Yemen? And we don't even have that on any talking points, or it's not even worthy of how our participation in this effort has caused hundreds of thousands of children to suffer, many to die, and not a word in our conversation. So we're going to have that conversation. But first, we're going to hear from someone on Wall Street, one of the leading voices on Wall Street, tell us what we should do about the coronavirus. Oh, that's interesting. And also, let us not forget that it was the Wall Street Journal, the Washington Post, the Times of London, the Guardian, all the leading newspapers in the world used the information provided them by Julian Assange. Now, Assange, with over 10,000 documents given to the media, has never been found to be in error once. His information's been spun on accurate. And yet he's being treated as if he were the world's worst terrorist. He's in solitary confinement for 23 hours a day. He has no due process. And we all know, or at least I won't say all, those of us who studied English history know what an utter corrupt cesspool their entire ruling class is. The entirety of their ruling class, their entire parliament, their media, the BBC. And if you doubt me, challenge me. BBC, I'll give you a whole story, because I was a part of it. I had to expose them, as as well as uh, Gordon Higginson, for suppressing a cancer cure that was proven to be a cancer cure, the best cancer cure in the world, Dr. Joseph Issels. And the BBC hired their top producer to do it. He did it, and they sat on it. But none of these people, these so-called bastions of honesty and objectivity, have supported Julian Assange. To the contrary, just like the entire corporate Democratic liberal community, they've attacked Julian Assange. Somehow, like Hillary Clinton and the others, bring him to trial, imprison him. He's a traitor. No, he's not. He is probably one of the most courageous journalists and publishers 
of information in world history. So we're going to hear from a former minister of finance from Greece who was at a rally for him. And then to a longer piece. This is from Charmaine Gooch on Meet Global Corruption's Hidden Players. This is really interesting because it can lead in some interesting discussions from it, and that's where I'm going to ask you to participate. So that's our lineup today. We begin with the latest on health and healing, and researchers at Western University are studying a molecule found in sweet oranges and tangerines, and it's called nobilitin, N-O-B-I-L-E-T-I-N. It has re- drastically reduced obesity and reversed the negative effects of heart disease. Two good things. Boy, we need that. So what I would suggest is this. I would suggest that each day you have one of two juices throughout the day. In the morning, green apple with lemon. That's your best. Three green apples and the juice from one lemon. That will help alkalize your system for those of you with arthritis and asthma. Those of you with um, pulmonary conditions, you might find substantial benefit rather than coffee and sugar and and some food going into the body that actually creates more cytokines and inflammation. Later in the day, have yourself a citrus juice with ginger, like you could have oranges with ginger, grapefruit with ginger, and um, either of those would be good. All right? And that would help you with your conditions. This is from the Orthomolecular News. Shanghai, the government in Shanghai, officially now recommends vitamin C for the coronavirus. According to this report, they're suggesting what amounts to about anywhere from 16 to 24,000 milligrams intravenous a day, but orally, just taking it orally, that's about four to 16,000 milligrams for an adult. And... I'm suggesting much higher than that, and if anyone has contacts with people in the medical community in China, I'd be happy to share a lot of years of experience with thousands of people who've been on protocols of mine with high-dose vitamin C and reversing major illnesses or improving them and extending quality of life. And it's strongly antiviral. So now the Chinese government is officially doing this at two separate uh, centers there according to this study. From the University of Nottingham in Malaysia and uh, the Vit University in India and Nanjing Agricultural University in China, they're talking about using micro, that means small particles, of algae, meaning you take algae, you let it dry, and then you can blend it up. So you take it from large pieces into not a powder, but a uh, much like oatmeal. And then it becomes a functional food, and you can use it to great advantage. Why? Because it has what are called different uh, phytonutrients in it, lipids, vital biologically active compounds, and this is especially true with two, spirulina, S-P-I-R-U-L-I-N-A, and chlorella, C H L. O-R-E-L-L-A. Those are the most powerful of all these sea vegetables. And these microalgae can help you with all types of conditions. They're loaded with carotenoids, and that gives you vitamin A. Astaxanthin, which is an antioxidant. Chlorophyll for detoxifying. That's why your green juices are always good. Remember, if you have a cold, if you have a flu, if you have some form of our own infections, your green juices and herbal teas are the two most important liquids to put into your body. Remember, a juice is 97% water, so you want to keep fully hydrated. And also they have strong antiviral and anti, anti-inflammatory properties, and, uh, and they're neuroprotective. They protect your brain. So, And they're also rich in protein. They're rich in folic acid, B1, vitamin E, vitamin A. And they help grab free radicals 
and neutralize them so they don't attack your cells. So, just just so you know that what many people in the health movement have been using for a long time and people in other cultures, mainly the Southeast Asia and Far East, have been using seaweeds in their soups. We've never done that in the United States. Well, there was a small group in the colonies around Virginia and up around Maine that used to use sea vegetables. <clears throat> Very unusual. So other people have been doing it by the hundreds of millions. From Columbia University School of Public Health comes a study about when you're overweight, you raise the risk for advanced prostate cancer. This is a brand new study, and it's published in the Annals of Oncology, the Journal of the European Society of Medical Oncology and the Japanese Society of Medical Oncology. So the takeaway message is this. <clears throat> prostate cancer is the second most common cancer in men in the United States. Fewer than one in three men with advanced prostate cancer live five years beyond diagnosis. Before this study, only a few studies examined contributing factors to advanced prostate cancer. Now, there's a noticeable lack of research on the linkage between what causes a person to develop the cancer and being overweight. In fact, there were 15 large studies and they examined 830,000 men and then they looked at how many developed cancer and they found that the BMI, body mass index, when it's elevated, meaning, well, in simple language, when you have a belly, that belly fat, if you're a man, that makes you more susceptible to prostate cancer. And if you have prostate cancer, the one thing you want to do, among many things, is lose the body fat that you don't need. This question was asked to me yesterday, or the day before yesterday, at a farmer's market when someone came over and I was, you know, I'm there to support local organic farmers and buy some local stuff. Though at these markets, you have to go home, wash everything in cold water, spin it and dry it because otherwise it's going to wilt because they don't take the field heat out. Something simple. Those of you... How many in this audience, in fact, does anyone in this audience remember coming up to the Fertiler Farm from 1971 to 1984 every weekend for four months a year, June through September going into October, where you learned about farming, conservation, environmental issues, acid rain, not using plastics, all the things that are now becoming more, more popular and you take home a whole gigantic garbage bags filled with uh, organic produce and also homemade bread, learning all that. If any of you remember being up there in your experiences, most people came on Sundays, call 888-874-4888. 888-874-4888. I'd like to hear your experience. Because on Sunday afternoon, I would drive back and I would bring the produce that had grown that week including large trays of sprouts. And the whole back of the van was just filled. You couldn't get in with everything. And I would then drop it off at the Fertile Earth restaurant. That's a, That was a cooperative restaurant that I opened up at 108th and Broadway. For years it was there. And uh, so there was only two items a day you could select. It. You could select uh, from two entrees, two soups, two salads, two desserts. And we kept it simple. We would serve almost 400 meals a night. And a lot of people from Columbia University would come down, a lot of the students, because a whole meal only cost you $2.50. I was able to do that by having all of us who managed it, and we each had to put in one day a week. So that's why we were able to give the food away uh, at such an inexpensive cost. And that's why it was, I, I called it a food co-op because there was no profit taken out ever and only the chefs were paid salaries. And we let everyone know that give a big tip because these people, well, they, they, they got a salary, yes, but they did fine on tips because we insisted upon it. In any case, it was a wonderful experience. So it was where all of the activists, 
would come and hang out. And I could always tell when there was someone from the FBI because they always dressed like, well, you can imagine, establishment people. In any case, uh, while I was supporting local co-op, this person came over and asked me a question. They said, can I ask you a question? Said, sure. They said, well, my parents are 70 and 74. They're in fairly good health. I can't get him to do a lot of stuff that I listen to on your show every day. And, uh, but I would like to, uh, I'd like to tell me, do you think that people, when they get older, they, do they get happier or do they become more cynical? So I, I stopped and I gave him an answer and, and I said I would address a little more on an upcoming program because it depends upon the meaningfulness of their life. What did they do during their working life that gave them purpose, meaning, dignity, and a sense of completeness? Or was everything a ritualized, conditioned response? Well, it's this hour we get up and we get dressed and we go through the same ritual and we have the same breakfast and then we're off and we go to the same route and we go to the same work. Whether we like it or not is not important. We have to do it. We've mastered how to do it. We could do it, you know, with our eyes closed. And then one day the children leave, so now you got the empty nest. And then one day you realize you haven't really shared the intimacies that you did at one time. Your passion is gone. The creativity is more or less gone. And then you start getting on the other side of 50, and you start thinking, I'm on the downside of life. Up until that point, you kind of play a game. Well, if the average life expectancy, let's say, is when I was growing up was about 73, then up to let's say, um, 35, you felt, hey, I got a whole nother life to live before I, you know, start facing the old age. And even today, life expectancy is coming down as back into the 70s again, going to the mid-70s. So by the time you hit 50, you realize you may only have 20 to 25 holidays, birthdays left. And a lot of people don't like doing anything. Why should I do anything? Why should I try a new project? Why should I move someplace? You know, what's the point? I'm going to die and it's just going to be in the hands of someone else. Well, everything's going to be in the hands of every everyone else. None of us are around forever. Go to Mount Vernon. Should George Washington have not have had that wonderful home on the Potomac because he knew he was going to die? So what's the point? Do you want to live like Nietzsche's philosophy? Very nihilistic, but with a, a difference. You know, whether you are, are positively nihilistic or negatively nihilistic. It wasn't quite that way, but it, in other words, have you accepted nihilism within, with, with re, with resignation and say, there's nothing more I can do, so why even try? Let's just go to a community, hang out with people we have nothing in common with except our age and listen to old music and, and just every day will be the same. It's Groundhog Day with a smile and a wave to our neighbors. Or are we going to become vitalists again? Are we going to be positive? Yes, we are approaching, all of us are approaching every day, one less day that we're going to be alive. But why not do it as if, okay, I don't have to be any place the rest of my life. So why don't I ask myself, where would I like to be? What would I like to be doing? Well, how about instead of being in a, you know, in a frequently a, a cold, emotionally cold, socially cold, uh, urban environment, or a sterile suburban environment, why not look to small communities getting back to the old way that people once communicate and shared and and uh, and lived? I think it's a great idea. Intentional communities. I think that that's going to be the future. And I'm seeing young people, especially young people who are nihilistic about their prospects in the existing culture, but very optimistic about not having to worry about, did my college degree match the job possibilities when those job possibilities are being destroyed with artificial intelligence, automation, visas, downsizing, offshoring, and I can't compete with that. But what if I'm in a community where I can do something that I enjoy doing, that everyone else benefits from, I can maintain my sense of autonomy, 
have my space, but still share a lot with other people. That's the future. And that is happening now. Many of us are part of that. I'm certainly a part of that. But it took a long time to get other people to be aware that they did have options. So when I said what I said to this uh, fella, I said, look, it depends upon how exciting by life, uh, excited by life your parents were and by each other and what potential they still had to master new areas. He said, well, they're kind of, they don't do a whole lot. You know, they, they, they're just homebodies and they just watch television and, you know, and they don't go out a lot and a lot of their friends are older or dead. So that brought me up to this article that I read this morning from Purdue University and the University of Western Ontario. And the article is entitled, Does Happiness Decline with Age? Now, this is particularly important because just next week I have to leave to to attend and oversee the next 60-day clinical uh, anti-aging study, which is the confirmatory study. We have a lot of people in it. We're filled. Please, no one call. And we have all these scientists uh, who are going to be on campus as well as watching on a daily basis. And from the first study, probably 95% of the participants, and some were as, as young as 60, some were as old as 95, I would agree with that, that happiness did decline, had declined with her age, because with that aging also came the diseases of condition response, meaning the choices you made, thinking they were okay or there'd be no uh, untoward consequence by doing something that you shouldn't have done. And then when those conditions came, whether it was COPD or uh, cancers or something else, then suddenly your whole life was one about, wow, that clock that I thought still had 25 years on it is now down to a year. In some cases, three months. In one case, one month. So you're living in fear and insecurity because, to paraphrase the Buddha, because no one knows what he exactly said, it was something to this effect. You think you have time. You don't. And we see this all the time. Tony Bark, she looked vitally healthy the last time I spoke with her and filmed her. And uh, and she went the orthodox road. She ran out of time. And during that period when you're running out of time or you're seeing the consequences of mistakes made earlier in life, you start to question everything. Now, that doesn't do you a lot of good to question if you're questioning from the Nietzsche perspective of a nihilistic thought based upon living, a life that was indifferent to reason and cause and effect. Well, what could, you know, what, what could a hamburger do? It's not going to do any harm. Well, what could, you know, smoking this or taking that? And indeed, one hamburger is not going to cause a heart attack. One cigarette is not going to cause emphysema or lung cancer. One drink is not going to cause stress of the liver. But once we start doing something and we get dopamine hits in our brain and we begin to feel better when we, that little, little pings of euphoria, then we get used to it. Now we no longer even bring into the conversation What are the likely consequences? So all negative consequences are swept aside. It's just like someone trying to hype you on an investment, like one of the real estate brokers trying to sell you a place. With absolute confidence, the market's going up, this is great. But did the real estate broker take an honest look at the type of jobs, what they pay, the crime levels? Is there, you know, are, are you owning your mineral rights or will a gas hydrofracking company come and put something up on your land because they bought the mineral rights from people who owned it before you? You know, are you in the right place? None of that is discussed. Only the positive side of an equation. When someone wants to have you invest in a project that cannot go wrong. Oh my God, this is the best deal ever. You know, it's not a lot of money. I mean, but look at the amount you can get back. Watch Stacy Keach's uh, American Greed, or he's the narrator of it. Almost in every situation, a person had money, had worked hard, were decent people. Then why in the world would they think that that investing what they had and then investing more 
was a good idea. Where is it written that we have to have more of something in order to be happy with what we currently have? So then we take what we've worked our whole life for, and we now start to dissipate it down based upon someone else's someone else's belief. So we're then investing in the other person, and by second nature, they're what they're selling. And just eat this cereal. You got to have this car. Look at these sexy men and women driving it at a hundred miles an hour down streets with no one else on the street and in rain and swirling it around and then look at each other and you think, wow, will that be me if I drive? No, you drive down the street at 40 miles an hour, you got a ticket. And at 60, you just hit someone else and, and hurt them. Eat this beef. Let's get over. Everybody go over, you know, and, and, and pig out at the football game. And is that good? No. Then why do we do it? Our conditioned response. So whether or not a person is happy going into the next year of your life, or sad and fearful, it's because what they can no longer control. It's like that snowball going down the mountain, and you're Sisyphus. You might be able to get in front of it, but it's going to roll you over, and you'll never be able to get back up for most people because they don't want to develop the tools. They don't want to take the time to master that part of life. So they live with foreboding. They start looking at the obituaries to see who died. They talk about what they once did and no longer can do. They never are optimistic about the future. As if they're waiting, along with the Edward G. Robinson character in Soylent Green, when they've given up any hope that life can be better, and they go in and they get their ticket waiting to get drink that uh, drink that will put them to sleep after they have one last little view of Scenes for 20 seconds of nature long ago and in distant memory until they become food for some unsuspecting next person, the Soylent Green. That's what they're reading. And that's what a lot of people do. So the idea is, instead of believing in Nietzsche, which I do not, I don't like Nietzsche. I thought, I thought, give him all the praise he had. If you study him, and I have, when you have Eric Fromm and you have so many other people who are so much more enlightened, and optimistic, because it's the optimist that heals. It's the optimist that grows. It's the optimist that goes out and and tries something new. It's the optimist that comes through fear and leaves it behind that does something everyone else as well. Hey, that's pretty cool. wonder if I could do that. Yeah, you can. So here's what Purdue University has to say. And this was published in uh, Psychological Science. It suggests, yes, people's happiness declines with age. And I believe that's only because they are dealing with people who are aging over the age of 50, let's say, and who are thinking the best of life is behind them. That's what we have to change in our society. And one last thing, and this is a part of that, from the University of Surrey in the United Kingdom, social isolation, that's mostly older people, a lot of young people, but the young people are not socially isolated because they have social media, which is a, which is a sterile, vacuous, incomplete and unrequited form of, of connecting with people. It's all artificial. It's all a game versus senior citizens rarely engage in social activities, and hence they are socially isolated, and that increases physical inflammation, and hence they actually speed up the death process by their social isolation. We are almost 30 minutes into our program. That's the latest on health and healing. I'm Gary Nall. We're going to take a break, and when we come back from the break, we're going to hear about this one man on Wall Street who's giving you his best advice of what to do for the coronavirus. It's only 26 seconds long, but listen to it, because I'm going to ask you to call in and give your response. Your response can be called in at 888-874-4888. Back in a moment. If you see me walking down the street And I start to cry Each time we meet Walk on by, walk on by, make believe that you don't see the tears, just let me grieve in private, cause each time I see you, I break down and cry. Think about how the world 
world would be if you tried to quarantine everybody because of the generic type flu. Now, I'm not saying this is the generic type flu, but maybe we'd be just better off if we gave it to everybody and then in a month it would be over because the mortality rate of this probably isn't going to be any different if we did it that way than the long-term picture. But the difference is we're re wreaking havoc on global and domestic economies. Think about how the world would be if you tried to quarantine everybody because of the generic type flu. Okay, so he's saying let's give everybody coronavirus and the weak ones will die off, and but the strong ones will survive. But more importantly, hey, our economy, the capitalist system, will not suffer the same consequences. Your thoughts. That's a globalist and a capitalist view of how to deal with a crisis like the coronavirus. Wasn't it, uh, wasn't it John Liley who said, The empty vessel giveth a greater sound than the full barrel? Well, we have an awful lot of empty vessels making a lot of noise, and the more sound ones we are not hearing from. Your thoughts, 888-874-488. By the way, I want to thank everyone who came uh, on Sunday to listen to the three-hour, it was three hours long, and that was without the video, just three hours, on how to deal with the coronavirus and all other viruses. And it was packed with information. I'm sorry to the untold number of people who tried to get on, but it was filled and we had expanded our web band as far as we could get. So we had a huge number of people listening from all over the world. But the good news is you can go up now to prn.fm or within the next half hour and it'll be posted and you can download it. Okay? So you don't have to miss any of it if you weren't able to uh, listen it to yesterday. Everybody needs to know this information. In fact, just this morning, since I'm on location, I gave... Uh, the insights, I gave a summary for a half hour to my entire office staff so they wouldn't be fearing this virus. I told them everything they needed to do to help prevent this and also to build up their immune system. All that information, but everything you can imagine, is in this three-hour webinar. And by the way, I, the, there's nothing posted now, but my next webinar in a month is going to be on 5G. It'll be with a panelist of about four different panelists. It'll be about four hours long. And it'll be with video testimony, and the best minds on the planet are going to be in that 5G. That's coming. Then a month after that, I'll do a webinar on what to do with mom and dad when they have dementia, Alzheimer's, or some other condition that requires your help as their child, and it disrupts your life. So how do you keep your life uh, going forward in balance and at the same time help your parents? So you don't have to end up like so many people I know just burned out and sick themselves. So you can help your parents and stay healthy in the process. That'll be my next webinar. So I just get and nothing up there now. So don't go up. Oh, wow. All the phones are lit up. Uh, OK, before we go to Greg, Stephen and Lloyd, and uh, I'm told we have Val in the studio in New York. Hi, Val. Valerie is um uh, for decades, uh, a frontline producer and editor uh, of our films, and she wants to say something. Hi, Val. Hi, Gary. So, yeah, um, the, we've been honored over the years for s so many awards for our, our films, but we hardly ever come on out the air and talk about them. But we received an email from the International Peace and Film Festival in Orlando, Florida today, which awarded us with the Best Documentary Award for Enlightenment. And I thought that was worth a mention. And the festival director, Jeffrey Gray, wrote that the 2020 season included films and filmmakers from points around the world. A total of 270 films from 55 countries were submitted. The competition was intense. Many of the films presented artistry and skill at the level that kept the international panel of judges' 
judges in debate for many hours, and in the end, the best of the best were awarded honors and distinction for their individual merits, but all the films have qualities to treasure and admire on behalf of the staff and volunteers of the International Peace and Film Festival. I wish to con- Bay, my gratitude and congratulations. And this is for saving the planet one bite at a time. So congratulations, uh, Mr. Enlightenment. <laughs> Good. Well, thank you, Val. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we, we, we don't mention all the awards. Uh, we've won a whole lot for the documentaries. And I understand that the newest one is finally finished and through all uh all of the different yeah, corrections, right? Yeah, all quality right? control. Quality control tests have been passed. We found out this morning, and so it's going to be sent to us, and we're going immediately into the film festivals uh, all over the world. So I'm excited. Good. And, and then sometime this summer, we will set that film aside. This is the most important film we've ever done, and we'll have a fundraiser for our sister station, WBAI, uh, when I come back to New York. Great. It's a it's a very important film, and uh, so now I got two more in the works. So <laughs> on to the next film. Thank you, Gary. Uh, okay, that's Val. Now let's say hello to the people who want to give us their comments. Greg from New Jersey, your turn. Uh, good afternoon, Gary. Considering about two years ago, a memo came out from Goldman Sachs, who was investing in health companies, that curing patients is not a sustainable business model. Should any of this surprise us with the, with, the, with the virus? And also, two questions, if I may, then I'll take the answer off the air. What's going to do us in first, electromagnetic radiation or fracking? I believe that way ahead of uh, hydrofracking will be electromagnetic pulses from 5G. I believe it's the single worst public health issue that has ever been addressed because you're going to have those who already have compromised immune systems, which is three-fourths of the American population, uh, and those are going to be the people you're going to see disadvantaged at the physical level first. And it will be subtle in some cases, but it will not be diagnosable because there is no real class of medical, let's say, medical definition for environmental sensitivities to electromagnetic frequencies. So just like golf war syndrome and restless leg syndrome and chronic fatigue syndrome, it'll be years before they finally say, yeah, we have now determined that these tens of thousands of satellites are responsible. By that time, you're going to have an awful lot of people who are, well, unfortunately, they're going to be, they're going to be sick and many will have died. Not that that will mean anything to the industries, and we're going to find out why that won't mean anything to the industries in just a few moments when we play a a video clip. It deals with this very topic. But thank you very much for calling in, um, Greg. Let's say hello to Stephen from New York. Hi, Stephen, your turn. Stephen hung up. Lloyd from Brooklyn. Gary, how are you? Good, thank you. That's good. That's good. It's a blessing being able to talk to you. I've listened to you on and off for so many years, and it's uh, able to, being able to talk to you now. It's, it's a true blessing for me. In regard to um, this individual who's thinking in terms of the uh, global economy, uh, I think like so many other people, we've been we've been taught that the economy is more important than humanity and, and life in general. I think that that the materialism that most of us deal with today is taking precedence over what is natural and what is uh, healthy and much more healthy for humanity. Um, So like so many other people, we have been taught lately, particularly as human beings, that technology has the answer for everything, which I know and most of us know if we think about it, Technology is more destructive in this day and time than anything else that I could think of. I think we all need to reevaluate what's going on with technology and those who are controlling the technology and reevaluate why we think as we do because we are and have been manipulated to believe that money 
and wealth is more important than life itself. And I guess that's just, just about all. I mean, I could probably think of more things to say about it because it goes well, really deep. And you, you have touched on it so much. Let's just take a moment, Lloyd, and and put this into a more whimsical and philosophical context. You're familiar with Mark Twain, right? Samuel Stevens. Mark Twain was, Mark meant Mark in the water when he was a steamboat captain, but he, he had a lot of great uh, thoughts. And one of them was, make money and the whole world will conspire to call you a gentleman. Think of the people from Bill Gates to Mark uh, Schmuckenberg and others who pride themselves on being beacons of enlightenment when they're just scourgeful individuals who have figured out a way to amass massive amounts of money and then everybody wants to be a part of their lives. They're invited to every council, every meeting, and no one ever discusses how they made their money or the consequences of that, but rather the fact that they made it. And it was also Roger Starr who said, Money is the most egalitarian force in society. It confers power on whoever holds it. Now, earlier, uh, Greg from New York said that, wasn't it Goldman Sachs? Yes, it was, who said that uh, you can't really make money if you have cures. That's what the, it amounted to, and that's correct. But, boy, they make money off disease. And this is when they start taking it from what it is, um, you know, an infectious virus, that people are most susceptible are the older people with already compromised immune systems, and they create a panic mode. They want everyone to rush out and start making irrational decisions like hoarding water and hoarding, you know, everything they can hoard instead of looking what should be done. I mean, why buy Perel, uh, which has a toxic ingredient in it, when you can buy rubbing alcohol or apple cider vinegar or even white vinegar and do the same thing? I'm not going to go into all the things you can do. You can go to parent.fm and download the, uh, you know, uh, download the webinar I did three hours and get all the details. And then suddenly you realize nothing that I said costs money. Nothing I said does someone have a proprietary interest in. Nothing's going to make someone else richer than what they already are. But it addresses the issues like no one else out there is addressing. So thank you very much, Lloyd, because you're absolutely correct in your analysis, and I appreciate it. Let's say hello to Peter from Tampa, Florida. Hi, Peter. Your turn. You're on the air. Hello. You said something about um, that is so relevant to me about the 5G. It's like, here's a thought I had the other day, that we're, we're, if you're talking about a realm that no one has experience with, anyone can call themselves an expert. Like like the, you were talking about the effects of 5G on people. But what I, why, why I think about this is because I'm blind, and now, like a lot of blind people, we're afraid to walk down the street because the curbs are gone. And it's like, how did they do that? Well, the Americans with Disabilities Act, they have the Access Board, and you're saying, but there were no experts about the experience of a blind person who – is using their memory and their habits, and suddenly the curb is gone. That used to be a vital warning, and the curb got labeled as an architectural barrier to wheelchair people. But what a disaster for us, for blind people, to eliminate the curbs. But what happened is, like, nobody had experience. And so anyone could call themselves an expert because nobody's an expert. See how that relates to the 5G? I sure do. Let's put it a different way, though. Let's expand it beyond what you've just said. You never have anyone from Sloan Kettering or MD Anderson or Roswell Park, well-meaning, well-intentioned people who want to see cancer uh, obliterated, prevented, overcome, or cured. They never come to people who are healthy in their lifestyle that prevents cancer. They never look at someone who has a healthy diet healthy exercise, healthy attitude, living in a healthy environment with intent, intentional awareness, and say, isn't the first aspect of understanding a disease, what is the primary underlying cause? They're looking at a defect in the DNA, but they're not looking at a defect in the lifestyle, unless it's something overt, like cigarette smoking. Otherwise, if you ask the average person, well, how do you prevent cancer? Well, you know, just... Don't, you know, modify your drinking. What does that mean? It's a meaningless term. Uh, 
like change we can believe in. That's a meaningless. It meant nothing, absolutely nothing. And then say, and avoid excessive sunlight. Well, exactly how uh, are you supposed to do that? Wear sunscreen or just stay inside? How much time should you be outside? Your whole body, part of your body? They None of the details because they don't have any. Instead, they have, they have taken the concept of cancer and sectioned it off into hundreds of categories. And this is the monotheistic approach to science and medicine and treatment. I even made an example of this. There was a study that showed that vitamin C would, uh, would, was able to help colorectal cancer. So by the very notion that it helped one part of the body, with cancer, there should be a reasonable hypothesis that would help other areas. Instead, they said, no, no, no. You have to do a separate study for every type of cancer in every organ of the body. So you would have to do a brain, a colon, you know, skin, lymphomas, bladder, prostate, breast, uterine, etc. You'd have to do like 50 different studies. Why not do one study that has the capacity for intellectual coupling that gives you a Quantum understanding. Well, we're a society that no longer thinks in quantum. We can't even think linearly anymore. Everyone's taking a ticket lining up for one begets two. Well, see how well that works when it comes to your one begets two, but you've assimilated so many one defects because that one hamburger is now 10,000. That one drink is now 12,000. That one laying on the couch for hours at a time and being sedentary, that's, you know, 20,000. So we no longer have the consequence of a single way of doing something, but quantitatively, and yet we won't reverse the logic and do quantitative healing. Do you follow me there? Peter? There's probably an entrepreneur out there thinking, hey, just as we sold people on sunscreen, we'll sell 5G screen. You can protect yourself from 5G with my new magic formula. Yeah. That's how we think these days. It's like, how can I make money from this? this you know, the, you know, the, Peter, the best example of that is right. the utter, utter hypocrisy of the corporate Democrats who bring to the United States Nancy Pelosi, Chuck Schumer. They all prided themselves in having the so-called uh, new president of Venezuela, who, who's a, a total fraud and neoliberalist and who's been controlled by all the special interests. But he is now considered the new leader of Venezuela. And we're saying because of socialism that people are eating rats. That's not true. Uh, and people have actually been to Venezuela. I've been to Venezuela. And you see it's completely different. Was it mismanaged? In certain areas, yes, it was. But was it also the greatest growth back to a more stable life for the poor? Absolutely no one has done as much as Hugo Chavez, but he based too much of his rebuilding program and his food cooperatives and his education program and his medical program upon oil as the driving force. He should have diversified. He didn't. But instead of looking at the real problem, we want someone to come in and be the solution without changing anything like the sanctions we brought to them, which was crippling the Bank of, or the Bank of England holding their gold and wouldn't give it back. And the same way with Hollywood, uh, Hollywood celebrities, they don't want you to have the right to own a gun, but watch them at every one of their ceremonies. They're surrounded by armed arm people. They don't want you to have a wall anywhere in your world, but they want to have a wall around their estate. Now, why not look at the underlying fear, the underlying sociopathology, the underlying narcissism that creates this idea that there's only one truth, their truth, and the people who have the money have the power, and the people who have the money and power are the policymakers and opinion leaders, and there's no other truth except that. And then you understand uh, why we're misapplying knowledge, common sense, and reason. People who think that, well, I, there's going to be a test, I better go get it. Do you realize when you go into a hospital when you don't need to be there, that people who need to be there, who have a heart attack or stroke, may not be able to get the immediate life-saving attention because you have selfishly gone in because you might be fearful of something? Do you realize what happens when you hoard masks and uh, then suddenly the doctors or nurses don't have masks for themselves, and that's happening now? Do you realize that we could prevent this from happening 
when there's no drugs that can prevent it from happening, the one guy was so foolish he suggested antibiotics for a virus, that doesn't work. Science says it doesn't work. Reason says it doesn't work. But when you have nothing else, but you have power and you have, you have, uh, you have a title, you've been deferred to. So what is happening, everyone, and I mean everyone in every institution who's being called authority are fools. And we shouldn't be listening to them. I could give you a whole litany on Anthony Fauci and why I wouldn't believe a thing this, this guy says. And, and I'm going to do a little commentary on that tomorrow from Charles Ortlieb on Anthony Fauci. But in any case, the people telling you that the economy is great are millionaires, billionaires. They're not the people working two jobs and are still homeless. The people who are telling you we only have 3% unemployment are not looking at the people who are living on $16,000 a year for family of four and falling down to the 150 million people who are in deep poverty and the 50 million who are in abject poverty. So the people who are least qualified, like Elizabeth Warren, did you see these pandering and just vile commentaries in the New York Times as if they know how to write anything else? That's such a crap paper about, oh, she represented this and we need a woman and it's sexist not to have a woman. No, I don't give a damn if you're a woman, if you're black, red, green. I don't care if you're gay or lesbian. That is irrelevant. I want to see the person who's most qualified for any job to get that job and the person most likely to serve everyone's interests, not special ideological group interests and identity politic interests, because in it you're excluding everyone else that's not in alignment with you. But power... Power does not relinquish itself. You have to strive for it. And once you have it, your whole life thereafter is a preoccupation with maintaining it. That means you have to have handlers. You have to have public relations representatives. You have to have lawyers. You have to have the people who say yes to anything because they will never acknowledge the emperor's weaknesses. And hence, whether it's Joe Biden, a complete idiot, and a total. In fact, you know what? Ah, We don't have time today. I'm going to play you what Joe Biden said earlier in his career and for years said the same thing, that's a complete contradiction to anything that any decent human being would want in a politician. And yet no one in the left media is calling him out on it. Just like no one in the right media called out, including Fox called out, you know, this, this moron we have in the white house now. So you see, it doesn't matter whether it's left or right, Democrat or Republican, liberal or conservative, they are all part of the problem. They are the problem. So why would you listen to them on the radio, watch them on television, read their books and articles in the New York Times and these other slop papers, or vote for them when they are the cause of all problems? And you, my friend, and me and others, we are the solution, but we have not been acknowledged to have any power. We have not been acknowledged on any level. We have not been acknowledged to have any benefit to society in input because we're not on their deferred list of the inner circle. We're not deferred to as, call that person, they're an expert. Go to that person, they'll tell you the right thing to do. Go to that third party person, they represent the interests of the environment and all people. I don't want someone who's going to be biased against men. We have a men-hating campaign now. I don't want someone who's going to be misogynist against women. I don't want any woman to be hated just because of she's a woman or anyone else. I don't want someone to only care for the rich to keep their riches, and I don't care for someone who's who's only going to be interested in identifying with one group of people. How how irrational is that? And yet those are the very people that we're giving all the power to make these choices. Do you understand how that connects with what you were saying, Peter? Yeah, we need a philosopher, like you told me about Lorenzo de' Medici. He knew, he knew you needed somebody who doesn't have an interest in a certain craft or whatever. You could bring together Michelangelo and great architects, but you need a philosopher who steps aside and says, what's going on here? You're right, and today we have wise men and women, and unfortunately we no longer acknowledge the benefit of these people, and that's unfortunate. Thank you very much, Peter. Real quick, Lee from New, Jer- uh, New York City, I want to get your thoughts. Okay. Uh, I emailed this to you, but you made no reference to it. 
There was an article about three weeks ago in the Financial Times. The government of Switzerland is not allowing 5G to give themselves time to check its health effects. You, you are correct. Reference to it. I'm sorry. I ha- no, I haven't you yet. Have. No, 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 no. I haven't yet, but I have in five articles I've written, and in seven broadcasts I've done. I, I don't. I'm, I'm out on the road. I don't respond to personal emails, but we have addressed that. We showed all the other countries that have also, like Belgium, we have acknowledged the cities in the United States and the, who are asking for more torium until the scientific studies. We have played you testimony on nine occasions of people speaking before Congress. In fact, last week we did one where uh, Blumenthal, Senator Blumenthal, was questioning all of the heads of the media companies and saying, what studies have you done or are doing and how much money have you allocated to see if your your uh, your work here is safe? And they all had to acknowledge zero, not a penny and no studies. Yet we show that there were over 20,000 studies led by, no, excuse me, 10,000 studies with 20,000 plus scientists who say the studies that we do have show that all electromagnetic pulses are dangerous. Cell phones, laptops, Wi-Fi, and especially 5G, because 5G is a hundred times more powerful in what it can do to us than anything else. So if you've been listening on a regular basis, you've surely have heard these. If not, go up to prn.fm and download the five articles I've written on 5G where it's mentioned in there. But also in a month from now, I'm going to do a four-hour webinar with the world's leading authorities on 5G, showing you the problems, but more importantly, showing you what we can do as citizen activists to challenge those people. Thank you very much, Lee. I appreciate your call. For all of you, and I'm sorry for all the other people didn't get on, tomorrow's another day and we'll, we'll have more to say. Have a nice day, everyone.